right, friends, we are ready to roll. And this will be a first. I got to stay behind the podium um, and so that we can record this. But let's just make sure we've all got uh, the attractive folder. And welcome to the MBE under the microscope. And just to make sure that we're all on the same page, if you open your folder, the very first thing we're going to see from the National Conference of Bar Examiners uh, it are the subject matter outlines for the multi-state bar exam. And this is pretty much um, our agenda for this <coughs> semester in the sense that we chose the multi-state bar exam. It's the 200 multiple choice items that everybody will take, I believe, unless you're sitting in Louisiana. So we know that this is a national test we're all going to uh, be confronted with this summer. So if you look at your subject matter there, we have got contracts, criminal law, criminal procedure, which are welded together as one, constitutional law, evidence, real property, and torts. We are highly motivated, and your group is highly motivated because we wish to take the bar exam in 2013 and be done with it. That way we'll be done before federal rules of civil procedure make their arrival on the MBE. So that is our motivation. They are already drafting the questions for federal civil procedure and feel that they will um, be with us in the next year or two. So if you look in your subject matter outline for uh, criminal law and criminal procedure, what you're going to see is each subject is introduced sometimes with a note and it says, Half of the criminal law and procedure questions will be based on category five. And that's exactly where we're looking today. Here's category five, constitutional protection of accused persons. And right there, A, arrest, search, and seizure. So we are narrowing down that focus to say, here is a topic that we find within criminal procedure and like any other MBE topic, this is the extent to which we know what the coverage is on the, on the multiple choice bar exam. They release these subject matter outlines and therefore we need to take them at their word and say, okay, the subtopic is the searches and seizures. They're going to take that topic and they will put it in the familiar format that you've seen a brief fact pattern and four options. Um, and we are to choose the most correct answer. So that most people who know a lot about multiple choice questions at least tell me, you know, the thing about multiple choice questions is that we can test in more detail, um, more nuance. And so in the Bar Passage Office, we always say, well, you know, what shows up on those MVP questions sometimes seems to be the exception to the exception to the exception. And so I can afford to have a broader uh, knowledge and a less um, detailed knowledge for an essay. I can kind of write my way and around and through various problems or uncertainties. But when it comes to a multiple choice question, I don't have that option. And so working with um, Tara Antiputo, our bar free representative, we tried to look inside search and seizures, and we found there are typically, as best we can tell, um, two, three questions, a few more that seem to recur about car searches, and we thought that might be um, a good place uh, to start. We knew we could find some multiple choice questions. Um, the other thing we have come to realize about both criminal procedure and constitutional law is that both on the essays and on the MBE portions, we'll be rolling along and you'll get to the end of a question and you'll think, you know, this sounds a lot like that case where remember the prisoners sacrificed the chickens and the, it's like they tend to be um, built upon and seem to be evolved from those big landmark cases. Um, and so, we get that same feeling in criminal procedure. And so that's the approach we decided to take today is that we know there are those key or pivotal cases out there 
on the car searches, and that we know that's the material the bar examiners will use to evolve these various fact patterns. And so Professor Brenner is our case law expert who's going to get us set with that foundation of the cases, and then we're going to try to put that into a form, some sort of, we usually look at a diagram or a flow chart or something that will help us distill that in a way that we can pin this down when we are simultaneously pinning down about a thousand other discrete little issues that we know are going to possibly appear on the bar exam. So we'll look at our chart or diagram, see how that does, and then we've got a sampling of multiple choice questions. These are simulated by Barbary, because remember the National Conference of Bar Examiners, maybe once or twice a decade, will release <coughs> actual MBE questions. And that's what keeps the bar vendors in business, is taking apart, deconstructing those actual released questions and trying to develop similar ones. So we'll take our chart, we'll take our understanding of the cases, and see if we can work our way through those three questions. So that's our game plan. And I'm going to turn this over to Professor Brenner. She's got a hand out your folder as well. Yeah, I, I hope you have it. Um, this is really simple. I think the reason there's been some confusion is, and we'll go through the cases, there was a change, the Supreme Court changed something in 2009, and there's still confusion. I got an email from a grad Wednesday who was practicing, and he was asking about an aspect of this. So this is one of those things, we don't, we don't make it harder than it is, okay? So let's go through this. Fourth Amendment creates a right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. Searches interfere with an expectation of privacy under the Supreme Court's decision in Katz. Seizures interfere with your freedom of movement. Seizures of a person interferes with your freedom of movement. So we start with, we're not going in chronological, we're going in logical order. U.S. versus Robinson, 1973. Officers can search the person of an arrestee without having to show a probable cause that the search will yield weapons or evidence of a crime. Traffic stop uh, for not having an operator's license, which is usually an arrestable offense. The officer patted him down, went into his pocket, his coat pocket, pulled out a cigarette package. In the cigarette package, there were illegal drugs. He, his attorney moved to suppress, saying, you have no reason to do that. First of all, where's your probable cause? What is your probable cause for going in the pocket? <coughs> and at the suppression hearing, the officer was asked, why did you pat the pocket? Search incident. That's our rule. OK. Why did you pull the cigarette package up? Search incident. Just checking to see what's there. Did you have probable cause to believe it was evidence of a crime? No, I'm doing search incident. Why did you open it, which some of the justices had a problem with? Search incident. I'm checking to see what's there. So it goes to the Supreme Court, and Robinson's lawyer says, look, an arrest, fine. You've got the person. But to search the person, and right now we're just the person, you should have to have probable cause. And the Supreme Court said, no, absolutely not. And this is the classic rationale. Um, the court said, this is dangerous when an officer takes a person into custody, especially in the traffic stop. This is a dangerous situation, and the Fourth Amendment does not require perfection, only reasonableness, and we believe it is reasonable to let the officer do a search of the person, a reasonable search, no strip searches, nothing like that, no cavity searches, but a reasonable search of the person for two reasons, to find evidence of the crime, and to find weapons. Well, Robinson's lawyer said, what are you talking about? You have a driver's license. What evidence of the crime are you talking about? And the Supreme Court said, this is an exception to the Supreme Court's, to the Fourth Amendment's requirement that officers get a warrant, We're repeating that being exceptions. Search incident itself is an exception. And the court said, the scope of search incident, going into the pockets, things like that, it's a given. It comes with. We don't want the officer standing on the side of the road trying to decide if there's probable cause to open the package. One of the justices also said we think that a, an arrest is such a massive intrusion into your privacy interests that this is also reasonable in terms of kind of an incremental search. Okay, that's the easy part, the person. Um, then we talk about Chamel, which actually preceded it. 
And what Chamel is saying, I like to start with the person because to me that's the logical sequence. You search the person. And what Chamel said is you can also search, and now we're talking about an arrest that's not in a vehicle, let's put it in an apartment. You can search what's called the lunge area, the area to which the person can reasonably be expected to reach to grab a weapon or to grab evidence and destroy it. And that's going to be kind of a matter of calculation. So the ledger, okay, that's why Chanel. Now we've got the scope of search incident. You can search the person and the lunge area. So the officer is asked, why did you why did you search? Um, why did you look at that table? Why did you look at this? Why did you look? Often, if the person is arrested and they're not fully dressed, and maybe they're arrested near a closet, um, they may could look through the closet. Why did you go through the closet? I wanted to be sure there was no evidence or weapon in the closet. And then you have to argue about, well, could you reach the closet, do a little fiction in some of this. Point B, search incident, me and my lunge area. All right, that works fine, reasonably well, with the searches, with searches of heart and places, physical places, not necessarily vehicles. In 1981, the issue came up in Belton He's arrested, he's pulled out of the car, they found marijuana in the car, the jacket in the car, and they search him, and they find the marijuana in the jacket in the car because they search the passenger compartment of the car. And Belton's lawyer said, what? He is arrested. He's not getting back in the passenger compartment. He's going to be put in the cruiser and taken away. There is no justification for searching the passenger compartment. And the Belton court said when a person has made a lawful custodial arrest of the occupant of a vehicle, he can search the passenger compartment. That's a free. Now that's Belton. That's when he changed it. The Belton court said, basically what they said was, we're not going to try to sort out what lunge area means with vehicles. We're going to say that if a person is sitting in a vehicle, you could theoretically reach items in the passenger compartment. So we're going to say that's a free. It's an automatic just as search incident of the person is automatic. So that's Belton. Then the problem with Belton, lots and lots of courts, especially state courts, said, we don't understand this. The person has been arrested and either put in the back of the police cruiser or is about to be put there. The person's not getting back in the car. We don't understand why it's necessary to search the passenger compartment of the car. And you had a lot of fracturing with state courts uh, deciding uh, some states said something like, well, you can't, if you're going to put the person in the, passenger, in, the, in the vehicle, in the cruiser, you can't do a belt and search of the car because they're not getting back in the car. However, if there's another person there, if there's a passenger who's going to get in the car, then you should be able to search. It's a lot of backing and forth. Um, Scalia never liked that rule. He was pretty much opposed to it. Now, one thing on Belton, they can search the passenger compartment and any containers, but not the trunk. Then we come to Arizona versus Gantt, where they're trying to sort this out. The court held that the Belton rule swept too broadly because a vehicle search would be authorized incident to every arrest, notwithstanding, and then in most cases, they're not going to have access to the passenger compartment. Which is true. Which is what bothered a lot of lower courts. So they're looking back at it. This court said that Chamel rationale, which is that you can search what is functionally the lunge area, the area into which the person can reach for weapons or evidence. That rationale authorizes police to search a vehicle incident to a recent occupant's arrest only when the arrestee is unsecured and within reaching distance of the passenger compartment at the time, which is unlikely to happen. Now, when the lower courts were fussing about this, some lower courts said, look, if we put something in about you can only search it if the person has access to the passenger compartment, police might take risks. Instead of putting the person in the cruiser, they might keep them near the car. We think that's dangerous, we don't like it. Well, now the Supreme Court is saying, first rationale, Chanel, only if they're there. Only if they could gain access to it, which is probably unlikely. But there's another option. And or circumstances unique to the vehicle context justify a search incident to a lawful arrest when it is reasonable to believe evidence of the crime of arrest might be found in the vehicle. Robinson. 
was arrested for not having a driver's license. Robinson's arrested, search him, put him in the cruiser. All right, he's not getting back to the passenger compartment, that won't work. Evidence of the crime of arrest? No. It's not reasonable to believe evidence of the crime of arrest would be found in the vehicle. Basically, for example, on those traffic stops, if an arrest results from a traffic stop, there's probably not going to be evidence. Now, in terms of the reasonable to believe evidence relevant to the crime might be found in the vehicle, what you're seeing now is courts are kind of fussing around out there uh, with, is that probable cause? Or something less? And the Supreme Court, of course, has not addressed that, but I found this D.C. Circuit case. Presumably, the reasonable to believe standard requires less than probable cause because otherwise, the search incident of the vehicle would simply repeat the vehicle exception. The vehicle exception, if an author has probable cause to believe there's evidence of a crime in a vehicle, we could search the vehicle. So the difference between the two, the difference between a Gantt search incident of a vehicle and the vehicle exception, as it was Gantt, two things. One, if not probable cause, reasonable to believe evidence of a crime of arrest will be found in the vehicle. And number two, you can only do the passenger compartment. And that derives from the fact that, as I noted at the end of the entry on Gantt, just as Alito in, Alito in dissent said you're overruling Belton, but the majority said, no, no. We gave you the same rationale, we're just narrowing it. Well, if it's based on Belton, Belton was limited to the passenger compartment. Therefore, Gantt has to be limited to the passenger compartment. And then uh, on probable cause, um, it can't be probable cause because the vehicle exception is an officer's probable cause to search the car for evidence of a crime to search the car. So I think the DC Circuit has a point. They said reasonable, not probable cause. And the notion that it only makes sense if it is in fact a lesser standard which gets a search that's less in scope. That makes sense. Easy enough? Really easy. Completely easy. <laughs> Nothing to it. Huh. Search the person, that's a given. Lunge area. I'm arrested in the motel room. I'm going to have to actually assess how far I can lunge. Sometimes courts are pretty generous in how far people can lunge. I'm arrested in a vehicle. I'll be the cruiser. Search me. I'll be the cruiser. Search the passenger compartment. Going to have to have reasonable grounds to believe that evidence of the crime of arrest is in the vehicle. But then, of course, you get things like one of the cases I was looking at was dealing with Gantt, the officer who arrested the suspect for a traffic violation, just happened to have a drug dog in his car, and just happened to run the drug dog in the car, and the drug dog just happened to alert in the car. Well. Bingo. Now we have probable cause to believe there's evidence of crime in the vehicle because we're crediting the drug dog. So we can search the vehicle. One of the things about Fourth Amendment, especially in the traffic context, is you can, officers can kind of start stacking these exceptions. Easy enough? I'm not getting nods. <laughs> Piece of cake? Not a problem? I suggest I can do this. It really, as you say, I think a lot of the confusion, uh, the person who emailed me on Wednesday was asking, can, can the Gantt search get you in trouble? No. You have to have the vehicle exception to get it, or consent. That would be another exception. Hi, you're under arrest. I'm going to put you in the cruiser. Would you mind if I search your car? Oh, boy. Which people do. That was good as well. But basically, what we've got, Belton is passenger compartment. Belton passenger compartment used to be automatic. It's simply not automatic anymore. Either the person has access to the passenger compartment, which kicks in your mail, or the officer is reasonable, it's reasonable to believe evidence of the crime of arrest will be found in the vehicle. You're going to search the rest of the vehicle to get in the trunk and you follow the car. Yes? 
When you say the crime of arrest, if they're arrested for not having a valid driver's license, does that, you know, they can't look for drugs then, right? There's no evidence. Okay. So, I mean, it changes Delta, <coughs> Delta, a traffic stop, and give the officer the passenger's apartment. But say they, they, they pull him over for expired tags and the cop smells marijuana, then... And he's got probable cause to believe there's evidence of the crime of the car, which is drugs. It doesn't have to be the drug dog. It's the officer. I think you'd be surprised if a number of cases in the winter where they, in a scenario like that, you pull the person over, they pull the pass, the driver's side window down, and marijuana smoke walks <laughs> out in the officer's face. Well, and then the officer, on probable cause, the officer will say, based on my experience and training, I've spent this much time doing drug cases, et cetera, et cetera. I recognize the smell of marijuana smoke. Uh, the smell of marijuana smoke indicates to me that someone was smoking marijuana, which indicates to me that there was marijuana in the vehicle. And then you get this thing with crawl constantly just drugs in the vehicle, that'll get you the passenger compartment and usually the whole thing. Which is why I said you can stack. One of the things, this is limited to some extent, Belton gave officers a lot more latitude. This is limited that somewhat, but there's still need other options. Yes. Um, I know you said that courts are usually generous with lunch areas. Um, if there, it's if it's an open space, or if it's like in an apartment or hotel room, are they generous with um, lunch space um, if, if it's outside a car or like that's? I'm not finding. I'm wondering that myself. They're not finding a lot of cases on it because usually the same police officer is going to put the person in the mm -hmm. Now, the one thing you can argue about is that this, this decision does open up what courts were, you know, concerned about when uh, state courts, when they were talking about changing Belton, which is, will it encourage officers to risk having the person close to the vehicle? Uh, I would hope not, but if they do, then we have to argue about that. And they don't, I mean, on this one, it seems to be, um, you know, Belton was based on pure hypothetical, that if the person were in the vehicle, they would be able to reach these areas even though they're not. This one seems to be based on kind of a lesser hypothetical than if they have access to it. Now, I'm not sure what that means. If you're standing there at handcuffs, do they have access to the passenger compartment? Kind of maybe. I don't know. I think as a matter of, as a matter of practice, the standard is the officer puts them in the cruiser for their safety. For both for their safety and the theory being that they're to the side of the road for the person's safety so they don't get run over. Whether it will tempt officers to try to manipulate it, we'll have to see. Hopefully they won't ask you about that. questions are very prevalent whenever we have a case dealing with car searches or the Fourth Amendment. So when Professor Brenner was talking about, well, state courts are asking questions, that's a, absolutely true. Believe me, we sit there all the time. The judges will talk about, well, how far was the lung area? How far was this or how far was that? So as a staff attorney for an appellate court, I have these issues on my desk quite often. And one of the first questions my judge asks me when we get ready to talk about a case is, okay, where are we at? Now what he means by that is, what part of the amendment are we talking about? Which amendment applies? What does it guarantee? And how does it actually apply to the facts given in our case? Now of course our case files are quite a bit larger than a regular multiple choice question, but the theory remains the same. It is very fact specific. What I also love about this um, session that we're doing is Professor Brenner just gave you guys the essence of some of these larger uh, cases. In her criminal um, procedure class, she probably <coughs> would have spent maybe two or three weeks going over this information, and it would have comprised a large portion of her criminal class that you would take for an entire semester. Well, what you guys just got was about 15, 20 minutes of the essentials, and that's what your bar prep time will be like this summer. You'll sit in front of a talking head, okay, and they're gonna give you the essentials that you need. And we kind of reference this in our bar passage class. They will boil down about a semester, excuse me, a semester's worth of information into about an hour and a half, two hours. 
So I love that you guys are here getting a sense of what it's like to take about three, four, five weeks of information, compress it down to 15 or 20 minutes. Now, the question becomes, how do I internalize that information? Internalize is a word I use in our class because that means I'm responsible for this information because what the bar examiners are gonna ask for me is, okay, student taking this exam, take these rules of law and now change it into an exam answer for not only a written essay question, but also multiple choice questions. So, we're focused here today on multiple choice questions, and they are very fact driven. So when we were asking questions before about, okay, what if it's a driver's license that has been expired, or tags that are expired? Well, we can only search the car for evidence of that, which basically means we really can't search anything. But, what if our fact pattern gives us this idea of that we're down in Texas, and the, um, maybe there's border patrol officers, and they think I'm transporting illegal aliens across the line. Now all of a sudden it opens the world up because an illegal alien could be found in my back seat, right? Could be found in the trunk. So it opens up the world to a lot larger of a search than if my driver's license had expired. So what I'm asking you guys to do, what I want you to start thinking about is, what facts are going to drive me forward when I'm reviewing multiple choice questions? Now one of the ways we suggest that you internalize these larger issues and the little nuances within them is for you to take this information and create something. Now, of course, your first year you were told, make your own outlines, make your own outlines, and we believe in that fully, because internalizing means taking it, putting it out in a way that you understand. And we're gonna preach that again in Bar Passage, because there's so much information, right? 70 pounds worth of books, right? We talked about that. There's so much information that you're now on the line for. So one of the ways that we suggest doing this is making a chart. Now, I was not a visual learner, I guess what you would call that. I wasn't one for charts when I was in undergrad and graduate school. But when I came to law school, I realized that charts, flow charts, kind of visual aids, was a really great method for me to take a bunch of information and create one document or a series of documents that are really gonna help me internalize that information. So what you have in your folders and what we have here online, or up here, is a chart that I created after um, following kind of what Professor Brenner was talking about and looking at the law on car searches. And so what I did was I referenced back to the bar Barbary materials, which you know most of us will study from this summer. And I was able to think about why, wh what is going to be required of me on this bar exam. I'm gonna have to know the nuances, right? Because our overriding principle is the Fourth Amendment. And then we go down to the next set of rules which is basically when is a search proper, when is a seizure proper, we come down even further, and then all of a sudden we're hit with all these exceptions to the rule that normally we need a warrant before we can search. So the idea becomes I need a way of getting all this information together. I need to pull it in. I need to rein it in. So what we can see this summer is a progression. We come from 15 weeks of study down to now we're getting about three to four hours worth of lecture from our talking heads. Now we come down even further because we might review an outline or a confisor that's in Barbary. Those are the books you guys will get. Now the question becomes, how do I pull that even further? Because as a bar exam taker, I'm required to memorize. In real life, when I have a question or my judge asks me a question, I don't sit there and say, well, if I recall correctly, I think the answer is this. No, that's not gonna get us anywhere. I go and I actually look up the answer. I do the research necessary. On the bar exam, though, you are required to use your memory. So the idea becomes we are going to create a document or a set of documents that are going to help us not only internalize but also memorize some of these issues. So as you can see, Professor Brenner gave you kind of like a paragraph for each case for the general composition of law. And that would be what I would consider like an outline form because we're taking the larger issue and scaling it down. We're going to take that down even further in our chart here. And guys, this is just an example of how I did this chart, okay? What you need to figure out for yourself, and this is the beauty of those first couple of weeks when you start your bar exam in preparation, what is gonna work for you? So if you're more of a flow chart kind of person, do it in a flow chart. I don't know how to make arrows in Word, okay? So I just, not, I'm old school. Bullet points, boxes, this is about as fancy as I get. So if you're more proficient in the word processing functions, 
make arrows, make lines, make squiggly, however you want to associate the idea of probable cause with arrest and everything else. For me, it's a chart because as we'll learn through our multiple choice questions that we're going to take, the nuances become very important. Is probable cause necessary? Does a person have to be arrested? Because guys, they're going to give you these facts and they're going to expect you to recognize why the facts are so important. So when we see something like, okay, this person was pulled over and arrested for driving on expired tags, that should trigger in our minds something very specific. Versus if they're pulled over because they just left an illegal fireworks factory with a rocket launcher, okay? That fact signifies a greater area of searching, okay? Now I bring that up because my mom's 65th birthday was Tuesday and I purchased a confetti launcher for the event and I am still cleaning confetti out of my kitchen ceiling. So I will not buy any more confetti launcher rockets. But the idea is the fact patterns will lead you to where you need to be, okay? So with that being said, this chart, hopefully what it will show you is that it is possible to take larger issues of the law that cover a grand amount of cases, that cover a large amount of time that you probably spend in law school on these issues, and boil it down to its very essence. Is this more memorizable, we'll make up a word, is it more memorizable than 70 pounds worth of books? Yes, right? This idea should hopefully give you hope that you will be able to accomplish memorization for these key issues. What it does is basically center on the rules of law that Professor Berner just went over, but of course we're using simple words, checks, yes, no, instead of long sentences. The long sentences will be what you learn, okay, through the talking heads and through your work with your original outline and your own individual work. But the chart will help you memorize in the sense of, if I see probable cause, it triggers this. If I see someone being arrested, it triggers that, okay? So the other thing that is great about these self-made outlines is as you can see, we added something to it just before class started. So what we were able to do was insert the idea that it's the passenger compartment only. And I've highlighted that in yellow because as my, as the students who um, have me for Law 685 know, I am a color coder. I equate color with importance, okay? And so when I see that I've left out something on my original document that I created, I want to therefore cue myself in, in the future, hey Jenna, this is important, you highlighted it in a different color, okay? So the great, um, one of the greatest benefits of doing your own work is that you can continue to add to it as you see necessary as you continue to learn the law. And what I would say is that you will be much more prone to know those little nuances as you continue forward, okay? Does anyone have any questions at all on the chart or any kind of method of using your own materials? to hone in on some of these rules of law. And friends, as you continue through Law 6895 and we have you do your outlines, this is the skill that you will be perfecting, is creating something on your own, which is why we encourage you to try different methods of flashcards, charts, outlines, non-traditional outlines, all those, all those different um, things that you can um, build that skill so that when you start your summer bar work, 10 weeks or so for the bar exam, <coughs> you are already you know, honed in and just doing it without even thinking, okay? So with that being said, we're gonna move now to some fun multiple choice questions, okay? So, if you'll pull out, we've got a, um, a handout here with three questions on it. Do not touch the answers. And don't look at the answers, right? <laughs> Wouldn't the bar exam be much easier if you the answers? That would be very lovely, but they don't. So we're gonna come in with the answers in our head though, because we will have used a chart, we will have created a chart, we're gonna be experts on this stuff, okay? So let's take a look at the first question. Now when we come across multiple choice questions on your actual <coughs> MBE, your multi-state bar exam, remember you have, until they implement the civil procedure questions, you have six topics, okay? So that means every question is going to be derived from one of those six topics. What you want to try and do as soon as you can is get your mind frame, what topic am I talking about here, okay? So some people choose to read the call of the question or they'll look at the answers to get a better feel of, am I talking property law or am I in contracts? Sometimes they will, and when I say they, I mean the examiners, will be awfully crafty and they'll word the question in a way where you really can't tell if we're talking about maybe torts or we're talking about criminal law. 
So it really is on you to figure out through the fact pattern what they're ask, asking for. So what I what, look at here, even if we were in, you know, in the criminal uh, procedure realm, I'm going to look at the question, because I've just come off of a really difficult property multiple choice question. And I'm glad to be done with that after 1.8 minutes. And I move on to this next question, and I think, oh, Lord, I hope this is in contracts, because that's my favorite topic. And I look at it and I see, nope, sustained and denied. That's really not, um, because of marijuana and unlawful driver's automobile, that's not contracts. I start thinking this is criminal procedure. So when I start reading my question, I'm going to frame it in the proper context of, I think this is going to be a Fourth Amendment issue. And my chart starts rolling back to me and all that work I've done this summer starts rolling back to me. And I say, I've got this. This question is about cars. So let's give it a read through. A driver was traveling through an area plagued with high incidences of burglaries and assaults. Acting pursuant to a police department plan to combat crime by the random stopping of automobiles in the area between midnight and 6 a.m., a police officer stopped the driver and asked him for identification. As the driver handed the officer his license, the officer directed a flashlight into the automobile and saw what appeared to be the barrel of a shotgun protruding from under the front seat on the passenger side of the car. The officer ordered the driver from the car, searched him, and discovered marijuana cigarettes and a shotgun. At the driver's trial for unlawful possession of narcotics, his motion to suppress the use of the marijuana as evidence should be. Okay, so that gives us our call to question. They're asking us, boiled down to its essential, should the motion to suppress, to suppress be denied or should it be sustained? So. What we can see from looking at the answers is, and this is very much on trend with much of the MBE, two of the answers are one way and two of the answers are another. So two of our answers are it should be sustained and two of them are no, deny it. Our goal, friends, at the very beginning is to figure out the first question. Should it be sustained or should it be denied? But we're held to a little bit higher standard here because not only do we have to get the right answer, but we need to make sure our reasoning is correct. So, as you will see this summer as you're practicing your MBE questions, the reasoning becomes the focal point. Once you figure out kind of whether it's a gut feeling, or whether you figure out, no, I know this rule of law and I'm pretty sure it's this, you have to take it one step forward and say, okay, now here's the reason for that. So, we're given this, um, these answers, two of them sustained, two of them denied. So, does anyone without reading further have a gut call whether the um, motion to suppress should be sustained or denied? How many things sustained? Okay, and how many think denied? Okay, so the majority of our class think it should be denied right now. Now what we have to do is take that gut feeling right further and be able to say, okay, not only am I pretty sure, but here's the reason why. So let's go through the answers. We have sustained because the marijuana was discovered as a result of the unlawful stopping of the driver's automobile. Okay, friends, this is pretty general, isn't it? They're not giving us the exact reason. All they're saying is that the stop, for some reason, is unlawful. Okay. It would be really easy and really nice if the examiners were to say, there's no probable cause, but they're not going to do that, okay? Your job on the exam is to take what rules of law you know and are comfortable with and actually translate them into how they're worded, okay? So the word probable cause is not an answer number A, okay, or answer A, but let's look for, further to B and let's see if we can get a sense of maybe probable cause was involved. Sustained because the use of the flashlight constituted a search of the interior of the driver's automobile without probable cause. Okay? We move on to the reasons it should be denied. Denied because the officer's conduct was consistent with the established police plan. And then D is denied because the discovery of the gun in plain view created the reasonable suspicion necessary to justify the arrest and search of the driver. Okay, I like all those words as a student, right? I see plain view, I think, I know what plain view is. That sounds good, that's a term of art, okay? And I like the idea of probable cause because that gives me something to kind of connect, to jump on. I know what probable cause is, and I know that oftentimes probable cause is required before police can search, okay? But I've gotta push past that. There's a lot to do in 1.8 minutes, friends, okay? I've gotta push past that and figure out where am I? Just like my judge says, where are we? Where are we? What was the images? What was the, what was the first thing that this person was stopped for? If we look back to the question, what's the first thing? 
kind of reduce the amount of perfume we're using the salts in the specific mm -hmm. Good. And so do, can we think of another word for that? What, what's something that the police set up? Roadblock. Yes, a checkpoint, right? Okay. Now, wait a minute. Did Professor Brenner talk about checkpoints? Are checkpoints on our chart? But they're asking us about checkpoints. Okay. So I like this question because we didn't anticipate that checkpoints would be one of those areas of law, maybe, that are more popular on the MBE. But that's okay. Because when we've looked at our longer outline and we've, <coughs> we've you know, moved it down to a smaller version of our own created outline, we learned the rule of law, and I'll help you out here, that checkpoints need to be very specific and they need to be across the board. So whether or not you remember this from your own crim pro class or you remember it from studying your bar exam notes, the idea is, is that if you're going to institute a checkpoint, it has to be across the board the way you stop people. So, it can be, I'm going to stop every third car, okay? It can be, I'm going to stop every car. But what happened here that maybe gives us some pause? Yep. Um, they were just randomly stopping. Yes. Okay, now friends, bringing this whole, for, this whole idea full circle back to the idea that they will give you the facts that you need to answer the question. Although I think they're very tricky sometimes, they won't leave you hanging without the necessary facts. So when you read this question, having studied it, you know, studied these rules of law during the summer, that word randomly, it will stick out at you almost as if it's in bold, okay? The idea that these stops were random makes the search what? Unlawful, okay. When we start with an unlawful search, what happens, or an unlawful stop at the um, beginning of it, what happens to our search, what do you think? Your choice shaking her heads, right? No, an unlawful stop leads to an unlawful search most of the time. So when we go back to our answers, are we all still thinking it should be denied? No, right? Now this was a little bit more difficult because we didn't just go over the idea of checkpoints, okay? But what I really like about this question is that the benefit of taking these questions is that sometimes the rules of law that you might not have put in your outline are pointed out to you. That's why we really stress the importance of practicing as you go, okay? When you practice as you go, you pick up on these little nuances that you may not have included in your original outline. Because you may have thought, they're not gonna ask about checkpoints. Well, yeah, they are. They're gonna ask about checkpoints, okay? And if we've studied this question, if we've taken this as practice, we will know that checkpoints have to be um, very specific, have to be across the board. We can't have random checkpoints. Okay, so now we are in the boat of we're going to change our mind a little bit, and I think we're all gonna um, vote to say that it should be sustained. But now the question becomes, which one are we gonna hang our hat on? So how many thinks it's A, that the unlawful stopping of the driver's automobile has rendered the entire surge unlawful? Okay, good. Anyone think it's B, because of the probable cause issue? Okay. Another reason I love this question is the answer is A. Okay, so once we've worked through it and we've determined on our own, hey, the reason this is not going to work is because of the unlawful stop at the beginning. This hopefully will show you that sometimes when they put terms of art in there that we're comfortable with, they can kind of be a little bit of a distractor answer. Okay, so what we want to do as we're studying is get to the point where we're answering most of the questions correct as far as whether something should be sustained or whether it should be overruled. Then take that next step further as we continue to build our knowledge of the law and our skills to get the right answer for the right reason, okay? So if this had been week one or two of your studying and you at least got sustained, that's a really good step forward. Because what you will have learned from taking this specific question is, oh, and the reason it should be sustained is because the uh, checkpoints need to be very specific and not random. So that's another reason why studying our MBE questions are so important. Now, how do we study an MBE question? Not only do we take the question to see if we got it right or wrong, but we review the answers, okay? Now, we'll review the answers in a second after we do our next two, because I don't want you to be tempted to peek at the answers. But when you take your questions, we recommend you take them in smaller sets, okay? Some of the vendors recommend 50 or so at a time. We don't recommend it at the beginning, because part of the skill building that you'll need is identifying whether you got the answer correct for the right reason. If you happen to get it because your gut was telling you one way or the other, and you just guessed, okay, good, at least your gut was telling you the right way. But now we need to know whether you got the answer right for the right reason. If you get it wrong, 
did you get that question wrong because you didn't know the law or was it because the question was tricky? When you start to chart these kind of um, trends as you're taking your multiple choice, you will be able to figure out the question sooner, understand what the examiners are asking you, and you'll be more familiar with the law as you continue through. So we recommend smaller sets so that you remember exactly why you chose an answer, so that when you review the answers, you know if you got it right for the right reason, or if you got it wrong, why did you get it wrong, okay? So we'll move, for, anyone have questions about number one? Okay, we're gonna move on to number two. A man and a woman were traveling in the man's car when they were stopped by the police for running a red light. Okay, right there, is that a good stop? Before we even move forward. We like the idea that there was a red light because they ran it. That gives us good, um, a good reason to, to stop that person for a lawful traffic um, violation. Okay, so these are all things that should be popping through our head as we read through. Before the police officer came up to the car, the man told the woman, you owe me a favor, keep this package for me, and gave the woman a small foil package. The woman put the package in her backpack saying, okay, but don't tell me what's in it. Oh Lord, okay. Before the police officer even began to question the occupants, the man blurted out, I'm clean, man, but she has a stash, pointing at the woman. The officer searched the backpack that the woman was holding and found the foil package which contained heroin. The woman was arrested, but the man was not. Is the evidence found on the woman admissible? First off, this should teach us a life lesson. Don't take small foil packages from anyone, okay, whether or not you owe them a favor. But the idea is, this is real life, friends, because not only have I had cases like this that I've worked on, the idea becomes, well, wait a minute, car searches we normally think of the driver, right? Because maybe that's our person who has a reasonable expectation of privacy. But now we're, we're moving that idea of reasonable expectation of privacy onto an occupant of the car. So hopefully, and I know this is, will be the case, you will have learned all about when the Fourth Amendment applies to occupants of a car, okay? And we know that officers can, in fact, search occupants under the right circumstances. So now our call of the question tells us, is the evidence found on her admissible? Okay, so here again, as usual, we have two answers that indicate yes, and two answers that indicate no. Gut feeling, guys, how many think yes? Yes, the evidence is admissible. Okay, how many think no? How many don't know exactly? <laughs> and that's okay too. <laughs> Because when you read a question and you're just at that point where you're like, um, yeah, I'm not quite sure. That's a learning experience. Because there will be moments, I promise you, on the bar exam, no matter how prepared you are, where they will throw a question at you where you just don't know the answer. So instead of panicking, by taking many questions throughout the summer, we will already be able to control our emotions, okay? And be able to say, I'm going to work through this in a very methodical way. So maybe you can start by crossing out any answers that don't make sense to get you down to hopefully at least two, okay? And then you can make an educated guess on that. We're not gonna panic because it's just one of 200, right? So even though we don't know the answer, we're gonna work our way through it. So let's look at the reasons they give us. Yes, under the automobile exception. Oh boy, I like that term. I know what that means, right? This is good, okay. Yes, since the discovery of the heroin was incident to her arrest. There's another buzz phrase. We like incident to arrest because we know from Professor Brenner and from our chart that that gives officers a little bit more leeway. Now, if you were siding on the idea of no, we can't use this evidence against her, we start looking at the reasons. Because when he pulled the car over, the officer lacked the authority to search it. And no, because the woman did not know that the package contained heroin. Friends, what answer there, without a doubt, can be eliminated? Okay, why does that make a difference? Doesn't matter, right? Okay, good. What else can we eliminate, though? Can anyone think of a reason we can eliminate C? He had the authority to stop. Excellent. He did have the authority. And remember, even within our first two sentences, we determined red, running a red light equals a good traffic stop, right? So we can cross out um, C and D. Did you have a question? I would say, but uh, didn't we just discuss that <coughs> you had the, the search had to coincide with the Offense. For example, if someone pulled, got pulled over with, without a driver's license, that doesn't mean that you but can search the car. But are there any other exceptions okay. we could use that get us around the idea that it has to be connected to the crime itself? They're in the vehicle, they can grab it. So which one is that? The one. Even, even a broader one than that? Vehicle. The automobile oh, exception, right? Okay, because the automobile <laughs> exception says if the police officer has 
um, reasonable belief, probable cause to believe that evidence of a crime can be found in the car, then they can search. What's the crime here that he believes or has probable cause to believe occurred? What do you think it is? As far as the woman goes? Yeah. Uh, she possesses drugs. Yeah, because the guy says, ooh, I'm clean, but she's got a stash. That idea of she's got a stash is enough for that officer to say, yeah, that, that gives me a pretty good idea she might be carrying. He can then look through her, you know, through her, her bag, see if she has drugs, and here it is that she does have drugs. So the answer is A, yes, under the automobile exception, okay? So because he pulled him over for a red light violation, mm -hmm. he can later acquire you know, probable cause that something else has occurred. Exactly, and that was Professor Brenner was talking about stacking, okay? So the idea here is that what that helps us determine is that the traffic stop at its inception was legal. Therefore, he's in the right place at the right time. <coughs> and then after that, he was given this idea of another layer of an exception, probable cause, that there were drugs in the car, he's able to search, okay? Great question, because when you're doing this, you have to work through these in a very methodical way. You're almost Iraqi, almost every answer that you're doing, you're just doing it in your own mind as you go through. So the automobile exception is the correct answer, okay? And then when we move to number three, we'll do this very quickly. Um, we've got, while on a routine patrol late one night, a police officer noticed that a car was weaving recklessly across several lanes of traffic. Ding, 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 does that sound like a reason a police officer might want to think about pulling this person over? Good. He stopped the driver believing that he was driving while intoxicated. Believing that he was driving while intoxicated is another way of saying the officer had what? Probable cause or reasonable suspicion. They're not going to come out and say, the officer had probable cause. But it's your job to translate that sentence into this idea of he has probable cause. By state law, the officer was empowered to arrest the driver and take him to the nearest police station for booking. Anytime I see the word arrest in a fact pattern, I'm going to circle it. Because again, that indicates to me that some of these exceptions that deal with the rest might come into play, okay? As he approached the vehicle, the officer saw the driver put what appeared to be a bottle in the glove compartment. The officer arrested the driver and then searched his vehicle. In the glove compartment, the officer discovered a vial containing a small amount of cocaine, of course, okay. The driver was charged with possession of cocaine. At a preliminary hearing, the driver's attorney moves to prevent introduction of the cocaine into evidence on the grounds that the search violated the client's federal constitutional rights. This motion will be, how many think it's denied, gut feeling? Okay, how many think so it will be granted? Okay, so we're all pretty much figuring that it's gonna be denied, right? Okay, good. All right, now we have to look at the answers. Denied because the officer was acting under a fear for his personal safety. Denied because the search was incident to a constitutionally valid custodial arrest. That's a mouthful right there, okay. And then we've, we've agreed that granted really isn't going to help us. Okay, how many think that it's A, because he was acting um, under a fear for his personal safety? Okay, so we're all in agreement that it's B. <coughs> you would all be right. See, we're picking up these skills, okay? We answered the third one correctly. So as you can see here, it's important that he was incident to arrest. Now I'm going to come back here and we're going to say, what was he, what was the officer thinking that the crime was? What was the crime being investigated? Drunk driving. So was he allowed to look for a bottle? Yes. Yes, right? Could he have looked in the the, um, the the outside trunk? No, right? Because what he saw was this idea that the bottle went to the glove compartment. Your bar examiners will give you key phrases like, he saw a bottle into the glove compartment. The police officer saw this. Look for words like furtive movements, okay? Furtive movements means the police officer pulls up, he sees the driver stick something underneath his car. That's the reach area that we're talking about, friends, okay? What did he put under the car? That officer doesn't know if it's a gun or if it's, you know, last night's burrito, okay? So we have to be very careful when we're reading our fact patterns to make sure we are tracking the correct facts, okay? Great job on those multiple traits. We're gonna keep